Welcome to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. In this podcast, we'll hear a discussion with director James Ponsold and star Jason Siegel from the film The End of the Tour, moderated by Amy Nicholson from LA Weekly, recorded at the Landmark West LA. When I think of this trip, I see David and me in the front seat of his car. He wants something better than he has. I want precisely what he has already. David. Wallace. Welcome to Minneapolis. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm David Lucy. Oh, How are you? hi. OK, David and David. We only just met. He's writing a piece on the tour. What's this story about in your mind? Just what it's like to be the most talked about writer in the country, that sort of thing. You're like a nervous guy, huh? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm OK. How are you? Because I'm terrified. I got to ask, what is with the bandana? I know that it's a security blanket for me whenever I'm kind of afraid my head is going to explode. <laughs> if we ate like this all the time, what would be wrong with that? It's like good seductive commercial entertainment, like, uh, like Die Hard. Uh, first Die Hard? First Die Hard. Great film. Yes. No, it's a brilliant The film. best. Hey, isn't it reassuring to have a lot of people read you? I think if the book is about anything, yeah. it's about the question of why. Why am I doing it? And what's so American about what I'm doing? All right, so Thank first, you. I just want to clear the air. Um, which is, uh, after making this film, how, uh, how is it dealing with nerds like me who want to ask you questions during the press tour? It's great. <laughs> no, it's exciting to be part of a movie where um, when it ends, y- y- you want to have a discussion. I think that's, uh, there's two types of movies. I think now there's the big tentpole movie, which has its value, where you go and it's escapism. Um, and I think that's great. And then the middle area of movies, I think, is sort of moved to television. And then there's this other area of movies where you go with friends and then you talk about it after. I know for myself, I mean, I've always been a big TV and film fan. And you know, when I was a teenager, I started writing about music and interviewing bands. And I interned at Rolling Stone when I was in college. I still, I still interview directors sometimes for Filmmaker Magazine. So I'm a fan, first and foremost. So I mean, I, I relate to David Lipsky. So. Oh, I like that because you've also called the tape recorder here in this film Chekhov's gun. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you meant by that and how you stage scenes with the tape recorder to make that point come across. Yeah, I mean, you know, these two guys, it's an interesting thing. I mean, um, you know, listening to the actual recordings of the time that these guys spent together, um, you know, which I in turn shared with Jason and Jesse, it's clear they had a real affinity for each other. Um, you know, I never knew David Foster Wallace, but I know David Lipsky now through this process, and he's brilliant, and he's just quick and has an encyclopedic knowledge of everything. Um, so you, f- you know, I, I feel when I listen to those recordings, if they had met in under different circumstances, they might have become friends. That being said, the circumstances under which they did meet were highly artificial. You know, David Lipsky went to write an article for Rolling Stone, which has to sell advertisements. There's all these sort of financial editorial pressures, and and that tape recorder, it's just there. It sort of it, it makes everything so much more complicated, you know, in that way. Yes. Jason, I heard to prepare for this role, you had a book club read Infinite Jest with you. Yeah, it wasn't my idea. I, I went to uh, to buy the book at a store, um, a local bookstore, and there was a dude there who uh, who looked like he had read Infinite Jest. And I said, uh, <laughs> and I said, how long should I give myself to read this? And he said, uh, first time. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, yeah. And then he uh, and then he called back to another guy who was like, hey man, guy out here wants to read Infinite Jest. And another guy came out and. Uh, and then it was like an episode of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. One of them went, book club, book club. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. And it was the most helpful thing because in addition to having a reason and accountability to get through that book is very helpful because it's hard read. Um, but I think also what it turned into was Sunday nights with four guys around the same age sitting around talking about feelings of loneliness and dissatisfaction. And it really spoke to me about the power of David Foster Wallace's writing because it's funny enough and he feels enough like you that it opens up a conversation and you don't feel embarrassed to talk about these things because if if this dude's doing it, then we can too, you know? I mean, what did you learn about him by reading that book? And I'm wondering, you know, also, this is the first time 
I believe that you've played a real life character. Yeah. So after intensely studying him and going through the process of reading Infinite Jest, what was it like for you the first time that you got into character as him and actually saw yourself embodying David the Foster Wallace? Shebang. Yeah, it was it was all very scary. It was getting to the point so um, that when James said action for the first time, I felt like I felt like I had done enough so that for the next month, this is what David Foster Wallace looks like and sounds like and thinks like. I I had to feel that way, you know. Um, and that's a hard thing because I think I think if you could sense for one second that I was apologetic about the performance, then there's a million reasons not to believe me in this role. And uh, if I if I didn't, why should anybody else? But it was scary. We had a picture to match, um, but I think. I think that Infinite Jest, in terms of character stuff, laid it all out for me. I know that it's a fiction, but I almost feel like it's um, it's an autobiography and metaphor more than that. I felt like he was every one of the characters and was telling me exactly how he felt through this story. And so I, I just tried to use that as a blueprint. Well, and what's so interesting, and I'd love to hear about how you also directed Jason in this, is that it's not just that you look like David Foster Wallace, it's that you sound like him. You know, there's lots of interviews of him that exist that you can listen to, and he has this unique way of speaking where it seems like he's almost saying more than he's saying in words. You know, there's a control there. I was wondering if you could speak yeah. about, about just capturing him even in a way that's not his written words. Well, I'll say what I saw, and then you can... Say whatever you want to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> when I was watching the Charlie Rose interview, I like, this is all how my brain needs to work, but I clicked into something where, do you remember that movie Minority Report? Mm -hmm. And where he has that screen and he's moving information around? I felt like I was watching somebody move, move information around as he spoke. Someone who had all the information at his disposal and he was constructing a fully formed argument right in front of him. And then it just struck me, it was like a guy conducting language. And that's kind of why there's a music and a rhythm to it. He just, it's all, his big giant brain. I feel like his struggle is filtering things out more than trying to come up with ideas. It's interesting though. I mean, because I think for people, um, like I'm kind of a Wallace obsessive. Like I'm one of those f fan guys that's yeah, I read. heard you had a piece of him right at your wedding. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting, so that Charlie Rose interview that, that Jason mentioned, um, I mean, I think for people that aren't as familiar with Wallace, they know maybe that he wrote a large, challenging book and that he died tragically. So they sort of work backwards and they assume that he must have just been a perpetually sad guy, you know? But he wasn't. You watch, I mean, I encourage all of you to go onto YouTube tonight and Google and go to your local bookstore and just consume as much Wallace as you can. But when you watch that interview with Charlie Rose in 97, he, you realize he is the quickest, funniest, most like, likable, affable, charming, seductive guy you've ever heard. Like at a certain point, like Charlie Rose stops asking him about his writing and just wants to talk about movies that are in the theater. He's like, hey, what did you think of Shine? And David Foster Wallace is like, are you serious? You really, um, okay. And then he gives this perfectly articulated, like three-pronged thesis dissection, evisceration really of the third act of that movie, rips it apart and then doubles back and apologizes for being kind of mean-spirited and what you get the sense is that this is a guy who's been used to probably his entire adult life and before he's even adult of being both the smartest person in the room of being the most self-conscious person in the room but also being raised by really polite people which is a, a very interesting <laughs> interesting thing and aware that he has a wit that he could could be merciless with but he, he could be kind with as well and um you know, I mean, again, it was interesting. I mean, Jesse Eisenberg had played a real character before. He played Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and Jesse met David Lipsky, introduced them, did a big epic sort of lunch, and, um, you know, talk, talked about, you know, his, uh, Jesse had a lot of questions and wanted to learn how to use a tape recorder, things like that. But I remember at the end of it, Jesse said, James, I just want to make sure, like, we're not trying to do a pure impersonation, right? I mean, we're capturing the essence, you know? And I was like, of course. I mean, because at any given point, there's four people in Saturday Night Live who can do great impressions, but that's a very different thing, you know, to really capture the essence of someone. So I think, you know, while the tapes were available to these guys and they could hear the vast majority of what's said, I think it was a tool, but we didn't want it to sort of um, tie, tie us down in a way. I think reading Infinite Jest and really sort of um, 
you know, you know some just deep conversations and thinking deeply about Wallace and where he's coming from. Um, really helpful. I mean, it's worth noting Jason's a fantastic musician, and he really have, has a musician's ear. So what you were talking about with the voice, um, I don't know if that was one of the easier parts for you or one of the harder parts, but it was something that you um, you did very well, very quickly. Thanks. Yeah. Wait, I heard that on these full tips, you also find out that David Foster Wallace has strong opinions on Hanson. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it was one of the really interesting and actually oddly important things about listening to those tapes is that there are some really um, intense conversations, but they're also on a four-day road trip. And... Things like Hanson will come on the radio and you'll hear a quick, quick being like seven or eight minutes because they can both talk and think on the spot. Um, dissection of Mbop. <laughs> and it was really important because you need to want to be in the back of that car. And if it's just two guys uh, being tense with each other for five days, you don't want to be on that road trip. But to listen to the biggest brain of a generation dissect popular culture, it was really fun and exciting. Well, I think that's part of what people connected to in Wallace's writing, right? I mean, he didn't live in an ivory tower. He wasn't in a hermetically sealed bubble. He was raised and lived in the Midwest. He wrote in the Midwest. Like, the stuff of this movie, the the, the places of this movie, the malls, the 7-Elevens, the diners, the, that's not quaint or kitsch for him. Like, there's a real sense of emotionality and nostalgia and, and comfort in those places. Um, so whether he was writing about state fairs or about athletes or politicians or about porn, whatever he was writing about, um, all these things he did write about, he was writing about the exact same things that we engage with and not just um, string theory or philosophy, you know? And I think it was that. He was able to articulate um, in a very funny, very quick way um, uh, deep feelings about the stuff of everyday life, which he did not find boring. There's some very good writers who seem to find those things... But you know, you, we all know those writers. It's that that would be beneath them. That's not serious stuff. He he never he never he never felt that way. He would engage with anything on a deep level. And he really loved Nicolas Cage movies too, which is awesome. Yeah, I th I think there's a real comfort, right? I mean, for him, yeah. I mean, he talked openly about his his TV addiction, and he loved movies. Um, I mean, he he had very complicated feelings about the power, the very seductive power of image. But um, I think for him, I mean, and he was a consumer in. I mean, it's interesting when you read the, um, the different syllabi that he had when he was teaching at Illinois State or when he was here in California. Like, there was, like, postmodern literature, but then there was, you know, like, um, Thomas Harris books or Stephen King books. He wasn't a snob about it. He liked the equivalent of a page-turner. He liked a well-told story, and he was very democratic in his tastes. I was listening to an NPR interview just since the TV thing came up just yesterday, and... Uh, the, the host asked him why he liked TV so much, and he says, because it gives me an opportunity to be around other people without having to do any of the work. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just got distracted thinking about what he would make of reality TV. <laughs> now, um, I'm curious, because when you guys were working on this film, you knew a few things that like Lipsky didn't know in the moment, and that you know weren't necessarily evident on the tapes, like that... For example, um, David Foster Wallace was on heavy antidepressants at the time, which wasn't public knowledge. And you also knew his future. You know, How did you play with that, with like this idea of foreshadowing what was to come of him or how much to withhold? I mean, we probably have... I mean, I can say, as far as the construction of the film... You know, I mean, David Lipsky's book is not a biography. Obviously. I mean, for those who haven't read it, there's a very good biography about David Foster Wallace by D.T. Max called Every Love Story is a Ghost Story, which really chronicles all the beats of his life, the highs, the lows, the vast in-between. David Lipsky's book is a memoir, a very subjective memoir about how he is affected by a few days with Wallace. So that's, so that's what you get during that time. And, I mean, the story is constructed as a memory story. It's subjective. It's Lipsky. It's the rush of, you know, the tape war, and it's sort of the rush of memory coming back. Um, so, you know, the audience brings their awareness of that into it. But I think for the actors, I think knowing, knowing Wallace's future really probably didn't matter. I mean, what mattered was the beat-to-beat -beat moment, you know, the reality of the exact moment. But you could yeah. speak to that better than I could. Well, I think that the fact that the movie opens with, um, with his death... Get, it sort of gets it out of the way so we can now move past it into this period, which I thought was just a really brilliant thing, you know? Um, in terms of how to play it, I thought to myself that one of the big pitfalls going in to act that part would be to take in too much gravitas, that this feel like um, a, a heavy movie or a message movie. Um, 
And it would have been dishonest, I think, because this is a period, these five days, he's doing really well. He's doing, he's David Foster Wallace doing as well as he can do. Um, and, and I felt like if you played everything that's led up to those moments honestly, then the indicators are there. I mean, he had the past that he had and, and he had been dealing with the stuff. So I don't know. I, I just thought to myself, I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. And if you showed 23-year-old Jason Siegel, 35-year-old Jason Siegel, I'm unrecognizable. So you can't really play that, I don't think. I think it would have been dishonest. Did 23-year-old Jason Siegel ever think you'd be playing David Foster Wallace? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think I was like, I was thinking about such different stuff at 23 years old. It's, a, it's an interesting thing that I've been thinking a lot about, but how you have these different periods of your life. I get asked a lot in these Q&As, like, uh, what a departure, what a you know turn this is, and I just think, oh, I'm, no, I'm just in my mid thirties now. You know, like at twenty three, a breakup felt like the biggest thing that had ever happened to me, and I went around calling it the breakup, and I wrote an entire movie about it. <laughs> like you know, you're just <laughs> your head's in a different spot, I think. And and when this script came to me, it was exactly what I was thinking about. How am I going to spend the next 50 years in a way that feels satisfying to me? It's also, I mean, worth noting, like, yeah, I never saw this as a departure for Jason. Um, you know, I read Infinite Jest for the first time in the fall of my freshman year in 1997. Um, I also saw Freaks and Geeks um, near the, Kate, it was on TV for its season during the tail end of my time in college. And, you know, I think it's one of the most beautifully cast teen ensembles ever. Um, so many great actors come out of that cast. And Jason, for me, was the emotional anchor of it. Um, like, I, I really, I, I felt that thing when I watch early Tom Hanks performances or like Jimmy Stewart or Jack Lemmon. Like, there's a lo level of surrogacy where it's like, oh, I've been that guy or I want to be, hang out with that guy. And then when Sarah Marshall, Forgetting Sarah Marshall came out, I mean, I loved the film. And I was like, oh, this guy's a writer, too. He wrote, he wrote this. And, the, you know, the Muppets film, he, he wrote it. And he's writing the Lego sequel. He's got his second children's book coming out. He's a writer. Jesse is a writer, too. And, I mean, a great actor can, can fake anything, right? You can act. You can use your imagination. That being said, if you actually are a serious writer, to, like, you say no to a lot of things. You spend a lot of time by yourself thinking it's great in your head and then being very humbled when some version of it that's not as good winds up on the page. And then you just spend hours and hours and hours and you submit yourself to the scrutiny of other people like hey will you read this and hopefully if your friends are honest they, they'll probably tear you a new one and then you keep doing it over and over and then maybe you submit it to the public and that what it does is, is it either thickens your skin or you quit but it's a process of humbling and tenacity that you know um jason innately understands um the thing that really hit me on this press tour and um i hadn't experienced this press tour you know, when we shot the movie, obviously, but I kind of wish I had because <clears throat> David Foster Wallace, so if, if I write a script, you know, it's like three or six months of no, I can't meet you for dinner or do that fun thing, right? And you kind of endure that. To write a thousand plus page book um, is years of no, I can't meet you for dinner. No, I can't do that fun thing. And the whole time you're clinging to this leap of faith that what you're writing is even going to make sense or that people will like it. You know, for years you're clinging to that, and then it comes out, and it goes as well as it can possibly go. I'm having some version of that experience now where the movie has gone well and people like it, and I guarantee you if his experience is like mine is on a press tour, after that, years of writing the book, it's gone well, he was asked what's next. <laughs> Before it's been out for three months, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the guy was going through a lot, I can imagine. What's next? Jeez, I don't. I have no idea. As what I would be thinking, you know. Is that the worst question an interviewer can ever ask anyone? Is that your next question? <laughs> <It> depends. <laughs> <laughs> lunch, lunch, lunch is next. All right. Well, I'm going to open this up to questions from the audience. Um, and as you're thinking of your questions, I have one last dumb question I want to ask. Um, Jason, how did you get yeah. the dogs in the scene to to hang out with you and act like your best friends? Oh. <laughs> Well, it turns out uh, that a dog ha doesn't understand that it's acting <laughs> or that it's part of a movie or the plot or anything like that. So there would be scenes that are like really 
uh, well-intentioned in their writing, like uh, the dogs ignore Lipsky but pay extra attention to David Foster Wallace. So <laughs> the way they handled that is they stuffed my pants filled with salmon. <laughs> That's real. It's not a euphemism. No. In a lot of those scenes where I'm doing serious acting, I got pants, salmon pants. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, sure. the controversy surrounding the movie, which I assume you mean the Lipsky estate, or I mean, not the, the David Foster Wallace estate, how is that affecting you? How does that feel? Well, I think that my, my honest feeling about it is I would probably feel similarly. I think that having a movie made about anybody that you love in varying capacities has got to be a really uncomfortable situation. Um, my feeling in terms of seeing the movie and being a part of it I feel like it's really an extension of the themes of Infinite Jest. I think that when you try to imagine, oh no, someone's making a movie about someone I love, you picture, what, I mean, you, you have no context to what the movie's going to be, and you sort of picture a cradle-to-grave biopic probing like the intimacies of your loved one. I think that this is a really specific movie about a guy dealing with um, a newfound fame, and my experience with press tours is that what's at the front of your brain are the themes of the thing you're promoting. And he's been promoting Infinite Jest and thinking about those themes. And so I think as a result, these five days are sort of um, a reflection of things he was trying to express really hard in his writing. So I feel pretty proud of it, actually. So I, the question is, when portraying a real person, do you feel any pressure to portray the person in a good light, or do you just want to be honest? Well, my, uh, what, what my strategy was, I didn't really think of if it's good or bad. I tried to, well, I think David Foster Wallace takes a leap of faith in his writing that we're all very similar, that fundamentally we all kind of feel the same way. I think that's the leap of faith he takes when he's writing. So I tried to find the parts of me that really identified with David Foster Wallace, kind of build around that, and then just proceed honestly. Um, while I was doing those scenes, I felt like I was doing the best I could as that person. And like sometimes Lipsky is really annoying, and that's okay. And sometimes I want to be empathetic to Lipsky, but I, I tried to just do the best I could with a guy who was like kind of bugging me a lot. So, so the question is, having lived so long in this perspective of David Foster Wallace, what is it like stepping out of that and going back to your normal life after being in such an intense personality or thinking of such an intense personality? Um, <clears throat> you know, for me, I, I just I think I'm much more acutely aware of time. Um, you know, how much time I have in a day to spend with on, on my work, with my wife, with my son, with my friends, how much time I have in my life to come, you know, and how I'm going to spend it, where I'm going to assign value. Is it going to be in my relationships? Is it going to be in my work? Is my, is, do I care about leap, leaving something behind? Do, you know, should I judge the quality of the pleasure that I get from reality TV versus an Ingmar Bergman movie or is just pleasure, pleasure? You know, I, I, I think I think more ab about that. And I'm just very conscientious of, um, you know, the power of image. And I mean, I'm very honest with myself. I'm totally addicted to TV and movies, um, like just great, it's a total addict. So I'm aware of that. And it's something I wrestle with. <laughs> um, yeah. I think very similarly, I try to focus on what's actually happening more than I necessarily was even aware of before. And I've also become more conscious of what I consume on the internet. Um, it's very tempting to want to click on these links that say, like, 10 celebrities with obscenely fat spouses. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It really is. And you think it's going to feel good. And you end up with, like, six browsers open, you know? Like, worst celebrity beach bodies. And I'm all of the pictures. <laughs> But I think that, honestly, it doesn't make you feel good. You walk away from that feeling really um, dirty, do you know? And uh, I've become more aware of that. I've become more conscious of that and trying to, I don't, I feel kind of bad for the celebrity with the fat spouse, but I feel worse for the consumer. Like, I feel worse for the person who's sitting in front of their computer doing that all day. And then we question, like, oh, and oh, I don't understand why kids are bullying each other. You know, these are all related. We're like creating a culture where it's kind of like fun. It seems fun to be mean to each other. I've become more aware of that. Since Lipsky did not, 
have an article published. The Rolling Stone article on the film is actually never published. Uh, what was he reading from in, in the film? Yeah, so the actual article at the time, I mean, Lipsky, as soon as he landed in back in New York, he was immediately sent to Seattle to write about the quote-unquote heroin underground in Seattle, which was an article that ran, and the article with Wallace just got killed for space, and because in 1996 Wallace was not as big an author as he is now, um, the irony, I guess, um, is that when Wallace did pass away, um, NPR asked David Lipsky to, to, to go on air and, and, and talk about him, and Lipsky was very hesitant to do so, but, um, but he really wanted to talk about what he was like when you were with him, the quality of a, a man who was brilliant, alive, and generous, and funny, so that he wouldn't simply be defined by his, his death. And, um, and after he did that piece, Rolling Stone, in 2008, asked David Lipsky to write an article about David Foster Wallace. Um, and Lipsky did. He wrote an article um, <clears throat> that was a, it's a very moving article you can all find that won a National Magazine Award about the last year of David Foster Wallace's life. Um, and after that came out, um, David Foster Wallace's family asked David Lipsky if he would keep writing, if he would write something else. Um, and that prompted David Lipsky to abandon the project that he'd been working on for a long time, find these tapes that were in a shoebox in his closet, um, <clears throat> and and write a book. And so he, he wrote an amazing book that came out in 2010 called Although Of Course You End Up Becoming Yourself. Um, and it's his road trip with David Foster Wallace. It was an acclaimed book, a New York Times bestseller, and that was what this movie was based on. Well, thank you. Thank you. James, Jason, I would love to thank you guys for coming out. And I'd love to thank you guys all for attending. Tell your friends about the end of the tour. It's a fantastic film. And have a good Friday. Thank, thank you, you very guys much. So much. <laughs> <laughs> If um, they're responding to your work and your work is really personal, then reading you is another way of meeting you, isn't that right? That's so good. Thank you. I don't know why you mean to me. I think that if there's a sort of sadness for people under 45, it has something to do with pleasure and achievement and entertainment. Like a sort of emptiness at the heart of what they thought was going on. I don't know. I got a real serious fear of being a certain way. I treasure my regular guyness. You don't crack open a thousand page book because you heard the author is a regular guy. You do it because he's brilliant. What is with you? What is with you? I'm not so sure you want to be me. Just be a good guy. All the, time. the more people think you're really great, the bigger the fear of being a fraud is. David thought books existed to stop you from feeling lonely. Living those days with him reminded me of what life is like. And the conversation is the best one I ever had. It's me talking as a tape recorder. I'm smoking, having just said I wouldn't smoke, I'm smoking. Just me and your tape recorder.